series called Our in the Now, and the now is September 14th. So thank you for being with us. Will you give us your full name and tell us what you do? Thank you, Jessica, for having me. I'm Wiley Price. I am the longtime staff photographer at the St. Louis American newspaper. Long time is right. Long time, distinguished, Hall of Fame, it, it really is such a pleasure. I'm, I'm so pleased that you took the time to uh, do this because this whole notion of photography and capturing life and everything else. Um, let's, let's talk about your, your job, first of all. What do you do and what is each day like? I guess it's not, each day is not the same, but if you would explain your job, please. Sure. Uh, before COVID, uh, like, like most newspapers, I had daily scheduled events. And the other rest of my time was driving around town looking for what we call standalones, pictures that you see on the street. You know, I, I'm, I see a picture for the first time, I go take it, introduce myself to the people and get to know folks. And that's, a, that's what my daily chore was up until COVID. Now I go out every day hoping that somebody's out doing something other than being in a park. Uh, the trap for the photographers or the parks were our haven the first month or so of COVID. You can't keep going to the park to get a picture. So now you really do have to get back into the street and actually find something on the street. So uh, I do a lot of driving around. So, so talk about the park for a little bit. So when it was novel, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, when COVID first started, I went to Forest Park because that was like the first week they asked people to really stay home. And I knew that was going to be a bit of a deal for folks who wanted to get out for the last time, maybe in a month or two. So going to Forest Park, I got great images. Uh, driving out to when St. Louis County announced that they were going to co uh, close uh, Spanish Lake, I went out there and got some great images. Uh, so uh, those were, were good. Parks are a great haven if you really can't find anything on the street. Okay. So like I said, once, once we did the parks for about the first two weeks, I knew I had to venture back out into real life and go, go kill something to eat <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to going to snooks. <laughs> so, yeah. Good, good. The nature uh, of the thing. Yeah. So at that time, you weren't in protective mode yet, were you? No. No, no, not really. So, so talk about that pivot when everything had to, when you were ushered out of the office, uh, meetings were different, et cetera, et cetera. Talk about those moments, those days. When we got that, that phone call, or should I say staff meeting on Zoom that, you know, this is going to be the last time we come back into the office for a while, I instantly knew, well, my job is going to drastically change because I have always come into the office, even when I didn't have to. I've, I live in two places, at my job and at my home. And my job has always been that way. If I can't find it at home, it's in the office. And sometimes neither one of those two things should be in those places because I just go back and forth there. And I actually live out of my car. So again, the hard work is, and also too, our other problem is when you find a good shot on the street, and that person chooses not to want to be in the paper, that makes you want to break down and cry. Because those images don't come often. You know, you see a shot like that maybe once a day. Mm -hmm. So when I get another shot that day, I'm, I'm always thinking it wasn't like the shot that you missed, the one that the person didn't want to be in the paper. So yeah. there's always that problem. And the other issue is they don't mind being in the paper, but they don't want their name used. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly when I spend a lot of my time trying to convince people why you should let me use your name and why you should want to be in the African-American newspaper doing this thing. You know, the first thing I would say to them is, before you say no to me, or now that you're so convinced that you don't want to be in the paper, know this. 
you are not doing a bad thing. You're doing a good thing. Something that would bring joy to somebody who doesn't even know you. So I spent a lot of my time trying to convince people to please let me put you in the paper for this good thing that I have found you doing. And it's always been a problem with me over the 40 years of working in the black community because we're always suspect. And that, that plays heavily into what I do. That suspicion comes back to me on a daily basis. Like, who are you? Why did you want to take my picture? Why are you taking my child playing right here? There are other children playing. You know, I have to answer all these questions and make people feel at ease with me. Uh -huh. And you know, you gotta remember when a conversation like this happens, you only got about five minutes. <laughs> people walk away from your car to police. One of those two things. Yeah. So. so you're talking about the role of the journalist as being suspect, the photojournalist? Yes. yes. And particularly okay. when people don't know who you are and they don't know the paper. Right, right. It sounds as if you also wear this public relations hat, Wiley. <laughs> and sometimes that marquee on me is bigger than the name of the publication that I work for. I mean, because you really have to talk to people and convince them that it's okay to be seen in a publication that is for your culture and that this is a good thing. Your child being walked to school by a father, playing in a public park with the father. Those kind of pictures aren't seen heavily through the African-American culture. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've always tried to do. And to do that, I've had to talk to people that I find doing that into allowing me to publish who they are and what they're doing. Like I always say to young black men, we have a problem with really being there for our children. So when something like this comes along, this opportunity, and a lot of times what happens to, to them, once they, I convince them to let me run them with their child in the paper, they see me a week later and go, you know what? You made me such a fan of my family right now. He said, my mother-in-law loves me. I had a granddaughter in the paper. He said, I'm so glad you convinced me of this. I said, yeah, that's what I was trying to tell you, that this is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And for young fathers, they need that. So those testimonials, my goodness, you, by telling me that story, I have goosebumps. <laughs> but my goodness, that, those must be for you too when you make that connection. Yes, it is, because I feel like I'm helping to bring us together and don't be ashamed of showing the good in you to the public, not just your, your race, but everyone. You know, the one thing that I always try to say to other people is, we live normal lives just like everyone else. It's just not seen in printed publications mm -hmm. as often as it is for the other folks in the community. Mm -hmm. And I try to tell African Americans that all the time that we also need to be seen that way. If you're a young black man walking your son to school, that picture needs to be seen and mm -hmm. celebrated among us because we have this stigma against us that this is not what we do. And so that's when young black men go, oh, okay, I see what you mean. All right, I'll allow it. I'm like, thank you. And again, they come home to their families at, on a Thursday afternoon after the paper's out there, realizing they have done a wonderful thing for their family and it cost them nothing. Mm -hmm. All they were doing was being a good parent. And, and some, lucky for them, somebody caught them in action. Regular old stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're talking really about a lot of warm and fuzzies and uh, this, this uh, need or this ability to connect and then COVID comes along. So how does that affect someone like you doing your job uh, in, this, in, in the context of COVID where, you know, now it's, it's stand back, we're, we're socially distanced, physically distanced. The first week of that, when they were asking you to cover your face when you go out in public, yeah, we didn't jump on board with that for a couple of days. I drove around for the first two or three days really trying to hunt somebody down that was walking down the street with their face covered. Who is we? We are the, the people that in the African-American community yeah. that sometimes get the message late that, hey, we have this pandemic going on and you really shouldn't be walking down the street right now with your face uncovered. So it was like two or three days before everybody kind of like, oh yeah. And particularly, the one thing that really sped it up for me was 
when public transportation made the announcement, you would not be allowed on the buses or trains without face coverage. That woke everybody up. I said, okay, I got to keep this in my pocket. I got to put this on before I leave the house. Then that's when the pictures became plentiful. Sure. You know, just to show you how much of us ride public transportation and are in the public that way. Right, you know, to get to your jobs, to get yeah. to your jobs, to get that's to school, whatever it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and, and of course, the African-American community, as we've seen across the nation, suffered greatly uh, and is suffering from this pandemic. Yes. And you've been capturing that. Can you speak to that, please? Sure. Um, one of the saving graces of the African-American community is the Urban League right now, because for 21 straight weeks, they fed us from... Well, I guess the end of March, beginning of April, up until last week. And, and those things are huge, uh, including uh, the, the Salvation Army. Everybody's on board with, we need food drives. And not just in challenged communities. Uh, we just had the Parkway School District announce they're going to be giving away free lunches to the entire district. You know, you were thinking that zip code, that wouldn't be necessary. Well, when everybody stops going to work, everybody's check comes to an end, no matter what you make. So it's, I think if nothing else, this pandemic may bring us all together in real time and in real space and realize that all of our needs and desires are the same and that we have to help each other. You can't separate anybody by how much money you make or what color your skin is. You know, this is a pandemic that knows none of that. You know, it's a silver bullet. It doesn't care who it hits. Yeah. Whoever it hits, guess what? You're affected. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, that you, you speak of the silver lining here of bringing people together because of, uh, again, it's invisible and it, it, it sees no color, it sees no privilege, it sees nothing, <laughs> but it, 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 it affects us all. Um, talk to me, please, about, I'm curious, your equipment, what do you use for um, taking pictures? I use uh, I use Nikon's D850s, and uh, I have a, a wide-angle zoom on one, and a mid-range and long on the other. That way, it covers all the bases. I don't have to worry about exchanging lenses and stuff like that. When I do do that, it's because the assignment isn't that big. And I'm trying to get different angles and looks, and I just put it on the same car. I don't have to load two cars; I can just load one because the environment, the, the pace of the assignment wasn't fast, it was slow. So you, you get to mix and match your, your images and move around physically in a room. Okay. So that's my equipment. And I have uh, two flashes that I hardly ever use anymore because everything is available light. Uh -huh. As much as we, we can. Where, where you can, absolutely. I asked for several reasons. One, because I think the audience would be curious. But two, in terms of covering, doing your work, uh, and your equipment, um, did you, were you, I hate to use the word paranoid, but were you cleaning your equipment at first, doing anything like that when no one really knew what was going on? Was there a bit of that? I think every photographer starts out just cleaning their equipment every day. But as you, when you sit on a daily grind like that, um, your sanitary issues on your gear may spread out more, maybe like once a month. I, I, my CCDs need cleaning in my camera right now, and it's been over 30 days. But uh, protests and stuff like that, they, they really wear your cameras out because you're out there in the weather. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, when I bought my, my last set of cameras, I bought sleeves to go over them to protect them from the weather, which has saved me on many a day now, because nowadays it, it, it'll rain in a second. So, and you, you're just <laughs> over there. But uh, also, COVID has bought brought me outside more than I had thought. You know, when we first got COVID, everybody had to stay in. But because of the police shootings, has brought the entire nation back outdoors at any cost. So, you know, the one thing that's nice about my job, every morning that I go to work, I never really know where I'm going to wind up at the end of the day and through the day. Yeah. My emotional roller coaster is steep on both ends. Mm -hmm. I can be shooting kindergartners in a classroom at nine o'clock in the morning 
and at 1030 shooting a homicide just four blocks away. Mm -hmm. uh, and my mother once mentioned that to me about the mental stress at my job. And I, and I say to her all the time, I said, you know, you, you, you try to mask it by thinking about how good the picture is and leave it right there. Not what, em what the emotional set setting is, but just the physical picture. Just stay right there. Don't cross over if you can. And it's hard not to because they're human beings. So there is some crossover. Did but you yeah. always have that discipline? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and unfortunately for me, I get a lot of practice at it because I'm in the African American community 99% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So when the George Floyd murder took place, um, you personally talk, talk. Hi, what was, was going on through your mind? It was an image, after all, that blew the world apart when they saw this. And that's, that's the one thing I always say to people when they want to debate whether or not a photo should be seen in the paper as far as this insensitivity. And I tell people all the time, this is how it works in society. When you read about something, you're very disappointed in what has happened. When you see the picture of it, you're outraged. And we need to see more pictures so more people can be outraged. And it happens, it happens here at the American all the time. When we run a story, a terrible story about a homicide, everybody goes, oh, that's just terrible. But when you see my picture of it, people want to call the Urban League and insist that I be released from my job. You know, how dare you run a picture this insensitive? And I always say to people, but you know what? You never say anything when it's a great story about this terrible thing. But when you see the picture, now all of a sudden you're outraged. Yeah. We need, we need more outrage, which means we need more pictures of it. Mm -hmm. If you really want to stop something, you got to show them the picture. Yes, yes. So again, how, I hate that question when some of the reporter asks, how, how did you feel? <laughs> but what went through your mind when when all this what what went through your mind in terms of what you thought your job would look like after this terrible episode well for one the first thing i think every time i see a police shooting especially something like that i always think you now since ferguson all the talk has been about body cameras normally you guys are actually wearing them when this happens but because you're not truly sensitive to the situation, you forget you have this thing on that's about to record what you're about to do. Because mentally in your mind, you're not in that space that you should be in. That space of, is there another way that I can handle this without physically hurting this person? Particularly fatally. You know, there's no coming back from that. So once, you're fatal, once you've been fatally shot, that's it. Game over. And I have seen so many situations where I'm looking at the police going, there was another way of handling that. One of which is you could have just walked away from the guy for a minute, give him a chance to get himself together, get back in your car. You know, there were other ways to handle that. And they want to argue, oh, well, you know, he came inside the 15 foot rule. Well, I'm like, well, it's not 15 feet if you back away. It's now 20. You know, but for me, I'm always outraged about it because I've always said there's a common sense cause here, even at a minute of where things are happening at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. You can see the environment and evaluate what this is. I have gone to so many shootings where I've gone up to a shooting and realized, nah, this looks a little bit too unsafe for me. I'm going to go back a block or two or go further back than I need to, but just to make sure these guys have this situation secured. Well, the, the police also can make that same call on themselves. You know, do I really need to shoot this guy who's carrying a brick? Or can I just back off and try to talk to him for a minute? You know? Right, right. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful perspective that you have that uh, a, a lot of people can, from which people can learn, certainly. So has your storytelling changed this year at all? Um, no. Um, no, not at all. So since the day I started here in 1980 as a freelancer, it has not changed. It is the same. It stays constant. The only thing that changes is that 
the situations are more outrageous because now it's 40 years down the road and what people do today in public, they would have never done in 1980. And I preach that to journalism students all the time. I go, look, don't think you have to go set up some crazy picture to get yourself known and get yourself recognized. I said, people do outrageous things every day. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to set it up. It's going to happen to you. If you're out in the street enough every day, you're going to run into this picture. Just two days ago, I witnessed a car accident sitting in my car right in front of me. And I was thinking to myself, who, who, I mean, how often has this happened to a person? That's only been maybe twice this happened to me. Well, I'm literally looking down the street and I see the car accident happen. I'm standing right there. Wow. Well, and that's why I always tell people, just shoot the picture that is presented to you. Good be, creative, be creative with what you have here. It may not look like much, but now you gotta, we gotta really think this through and you don't have all day to go, hmm, maybe I'll go stand over there. Well, by the time you do that, the picture's over. You know, you gotta, you gotta really move on your feet and be quick. And a lot of times it doesn't work out. And like I tell people all the time, pictures <laughs> are like stories. Not every picture you take is an award-winning shot. Sometimes it just needs to illustrate what happened. Right. It's, it's, it, there, that sometimes is power. There's a great deal of power in the simplicity of the image. Well, I think journalism students can learn a lot from this whole notion of nuance and simplicity. <laughs> well, sure. my biggest complaint right now about photojournalism is let's not get too into mm -hmm. the software on our computer. You still got to shoot the picture. Okay. Use the exposure in the camera and shoot the shot in the camera. Don't give it to me after you've doctored it so much in the computer. When I'm looking at the original image, this looks like two different things going on here. <laughs> so, you know, that, that is an uh, issue for me with technology. We've gotten so great now that, you know, let's not make it look too pretty now. We still we need to work on the creativity as you create it. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of that in your bailiwick? Uh, yes. I think right now journalism has fallen into the lap of it's got to look pretty. Well, sometimes a murder scene or a homicide doesn't look pretty. It just looks like it is. And, and you're doing all this stuff in Photoshop or whatever you're using. You're not helping. You know, tell the truth of the picture. There it is right there. Mm -hmm. Yes, you had to do this. They had to maybe sharpen it or crop it differently. Okay, I get that. But all this other stuff, you know, let's leave it there. So tell me, Wiley, how have press conferences been? Um, have you been a witness of a press conference and behaved differently now since COVID? Oh, sure. You know, the funny thing about the COVID is the fact that we've had to learn to be unsociable. You don't shake hands with people. You don't hug them. You know, you stand back and everybody you run into looks like they are on their way to a bank robbery. <laughs> so, so we all look suspicious to each other. It's just, you know, it's, it's just funny to see how things can change in a society that you would think are not possible. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say to people all this time, never say something is impossible when it comes to a society. Societies can change on a dime. And, and, and this has. Just think the whole planet right now is in chaos. Everyone is losing people to a virus. So we're not as yeah. immune as we thought. And, and, and the civil unrest, certainly, that we are witnessing. And, you know, I guess the systemic racism issues, addressing those, um, have you in some way tried to address that yourself uh, as you do your work? Yes. And the thing about <laughs> me addressing things is that the general public does it for me. My opinion is really yours. When I see you doing this, I am documenting what you are doing. And a funny thing about, right in the midst of all these police officers shooting black people, there was also the issue of just race as a whole inside Blacks, Black Lives Matters. Well, about three months ago, I'm going to a protest in front of the police station and the protest was so heavily female and white, it made me think that I came to the wrong thing. I mean, I, I really like, I looked around, I was like, 
Am I saying things? Or where are the black people at the protests? <laughs> Just because I mean, and it, it was a Black Lives Matters protest, but we weren't really there in the numbers that I had expected. And the amount of white women was just overwhelming to me. I haven't walked up to another photographer and I said to them, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And this, this woman said, what? I said, all these white women at the Black Lives Matter <laughs> protest and they're, they're outnumbering the African-Americans. Those kind of things are extremely exciting to me because I work for a black publication. Right, so you and think they're, you they're just shoot the truth. You yeah. shoot the truth. This is what's in front of me, this is what I'm shooting. And somebody even mentioned it to me, said, what was with the four white women? I said, they had the signs and they were surrounded by other white women. I could not ignore them. <laughs> they were right in my face. I turned around and they were watching right towards me. And I saw the picture instantly. And I just went, holy cow, look at this. And I just shot it. It's coming right out towards me. And then as we went on, I really had to kind of like stand back and evaluate the ratio of black to white. And we were outnumbered. For, for a while, for about the first hour or so, we were outnumbered at our own protest in front of the police department. And, and to me, I felt like the straight man in my own joke. You know, it's just like, I'm being punked right here and I don't even know it. <laughs> That's great. You'll remember that, of course. Well, how, how do you think the community can sustain that? You know, people are maybe walking the talk right now. It's been what, since June? Yes. Been. Floyd, but how, how can we continue to walk or walk that talk? I think it will be continued because for one, older adults like myself always say what our, our ancestors always said, young people are always late to the party. Well, here's a party where the young people are here now and they're awake and you might not like what you see, but we want them to have input and here it is. There's no guarantee you're going to like it, but this is what it is. And Corey Bush is a prime example of that. She came right in and she worked very, very hard and convinced the other young people, I need you to start voting and I need you to vote for me and this is why. And this is going on all over the country. So here we are where the social atmosphere of politics, the social atmosphere of socialism is all changing simultaneously. And you better watch out because you might not like it, what you see. But here we are. And it's very exciting. It's an exciting time. So we'll go back to this interview one day. And then we hope uh, history will you know, prove you right. Um, going back to the office, do you foresee that anytime soon? Although, again, you don't go to the office so much. But you still have, you used to have those meetings. You used right. to be with your fellow journalists. I'm thinking probably maybe November or after Thanksgiving. Okay, you're hopeful. Hopeful, yes. Hopeful, optimistic. Very. Yeah. yeah. Now we're in the middle of school started, um, you know, again, calling this uh, our in the now. It's September 14th, the election's coming. Um, what do you see your job looking like? The same? Yes, just pictured differently. The way I shoot society now is going to look different, which I'm really kind of happy about because you can see the transition into the future. We are about to change the way we live and it's already started. And it's good to be able to see from when I started 40 years ago in 1980, the world looked nothing like it did just five months ago. So now here we are, and it's going to change, and it's not going back. Mm -hmm. What is changing is here permanently. Like, before my mother passed away, and she's been gone now six years, she was looking at a commercial and saw the car parallel park itself. And she grabbed my leg. She went, wait a minute. Did I just see what I thought I saw? I was like, yes, Mom. I said, before you leave here, cars will be able to park themselves. I said, and there it is right there. And she, it, it just dumbfounded her. She was like, oh, my God. I said, yes. Welcome to the future again. That's true. Did your mom influence you uh, greatly? I had to remind my mother of this story one time. Well, after my father passed away in 1969, uh, I was in sixth grade, and, I, and after that, I was starting junior high school. My mother came home from work one day, and she said, okay, enough of this childhood business. You need to do some growing up. So you're going to start watching the news, and we're going to have a conversation about what's going on in the world. 
That's the worst thing you can say to a kid in preteen. We don't want to watch the news. We don't care what's going on in the world. I couldn't believe she was talking to me like this. And so it actually angered me. She said, I want you to read these magazines every day, and you don't even have to read them. Just look at the pictures. The magazines were Life Magazine, Ebony, Newsweek, Time, and Look. That's when Look was still publishing. She said, these five magazines, you look at them, look at the pictures, and once a week, we'll have a discussion. Once a week was every Saturday night, we sat down, pulled the magazines out, and would discuss the pictures and what the story was about. It amazed me that a photographer could take a picture so powerful that you wouldn't even have to read the caption. You already get it. And I was thinking to me to myself, these guys are gifted that they can take a picture right at that moment. And I couldn't, as being a 13 year old, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to do that. So that, that interests me. And I thought, boy, reading it is easy because it explains everything to you with words, but the picture, you've got to do some comprehending here and it's the photographer's job to make you want to think about this. I just thought that, 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 that that's a cool job to have. Yeah, bless your mom <laughs> for that sensibility. So what was your first camera? My first camera was a Vivitar XC3 that my mother bought me for Christmas in 1978 at Famous and Bar in Clayton. That's beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Oh, Wiley, this is great. I am so happy that we've had this time. It sounds like a Carol Burnett show. Is that, is that right? I'm so happy we had this time together. <laughs> no. This is great. Anything? Yeah, you're doing okay. Yes, I am. You're doing okay. That's, that's good. We are so honored that you, you have this time with us at the St. Louis Press Club and for the community and, and for history. I just and, want to tell you that, you know, I think St. Louis has a wonderful press corps. And I, I say that from a very narrow point of view because I I'm, I'm not visit enough other cities to understand their press corps. But I think the one thing that's nice about our press corps is that we all get along, even when we disagree with each other. We make wonderful conversation about major topics going on in our city. And when we disagree, we both understand each other's sides. But when we get together, we have a lot of fun with each other. We enjoy each other's families and each other's conversation. And so yeah. we're very lucky that we have that kind of crew around us. I would agree. And you're at a great paper, Dr. Suggs, Chris King, and everybody. Um, I had the, the uh, um, honor of interviewing uh, Rebecca Rivas as well. And that was great. Mm -hmm. So I'm thankful personally and then on behalf of the St. Louis Press Club. Thank you, Wiley. Thank you. Be well, be safe, and I hope I see you again soon. You will. Thank you, Jessica. Bye-bye. Okay.